Hey everyone, my name is Nick from Coffee Before Arch and welcome to episode one of MIPS Crash Course. So in this video series, we're going to be going over uh, the basics of the MIPS assembly language and going through a lot of examples of uh, uh, assembly code and some programs that we can make that kind of explore the range of features and uh, really the instruction set that is MIPS. Now, uh, before we start off, there's a couple things that we should note. So first of all, uh, we're going to be using the uh, Mars uh, MIPS simulator. And the reason why this is a simulator, not just an IDE, is because, you know, let's see, in the computer that I have done here, I do not have a MIPS machine. And uh, likely cases, you, d you don't have one as well. Uh, so we need a an actual simulator for the MIPS architecture in order to run this assembly code. And so uh, most computers have an x86 processor in it. Uh, x86 is what's known as a co uh, complex instruction set architecture versus a uh, risk or reduced instruction set architecture. Now, on the one side, complex instruction set architectures came around at a time where you know, we were actually doing programming in uh, assembly language. And so we wanted really, really flexible instructions that were really, really powerful so we didn't have to write a thousand lines of assembly. Now, you know, along came compilers and compilers got to be pretty good. And we didn't want to write assembly anymore. We wanted to write things and say C or C++. And uh, what became more important was can we generate good code with a compiler? And then also, can that underlying code be easily exploited, uh, that assembly code that we generate be exploited by hardware easily. So uh, what does this mean? So if we have, say, complex instructions that are, say, variable length or, or have you know multiple addressing modes or can take operands that are from the registers or from memory, uh, this can be, very, can be pretty difficult to deal with in the, in the pipeline. And uh, if it's difficult to manage in the pipeline, that means it's going to be difficult to do, you know, novel architectures that exploit these types of, uh, or this, this class of instructions. Now, reduced instructions that are risk type assembly languages um, are great at this. So A, because they're so simple, it's really easy to generate code for them. And then B, also because they're so simple, inside of the pipeline themselves, it's really easy to design hardware around that and to shuffle around instructions um, and find opportunities for uh, what's known as instruction level parallelism. So how can we interleave instructions that are non-dependent? When we have these larger complex instructions, uh, you know, one complex instruction may translate to multiple uh, uh, smaller instructions in risk and so we lose that opportunity to kind of mix those around and find some parallelism there. Uh, so enough about that, let's actually get into what we're doing today. So like all good programming classes, uh, we're gonna start with a simple hello world example and we'll see how we actually do this in assembly language instead. So we start out with this dot text right here, which is already different than what we normally see in you know a high level programming language. So this dot text is a directive that means, uh, oh, we have means twice here. It's a directive that means uh, instructions that follow are part of the program. So when we start our program, um, the instruction that it looks for first will be inside of uh, this, um, this section that's labeled uh, this dot text. Uh, now for convenience and to do kind of like a C style uh, program, we can define a label that says main. And so uh, this is something that we can use kind of like, uh, you know, like a function. So we can jump to a label, we can use a label, uh, to, you know, to represent a variable, which we'll see in a little bit. Um, but unlike a C uh, program, this label isn't necessary, we don't need a main function, so to speak, in order to execute our code, we just need the instructions. That's part of this uh, uh, after we specify this dot text directive. So the first thing we're going to do is because we're printing something, we actually need to tell the, uh, we actually need to set up that print. So normally when we do say um, in C, if we do say printf or in C++, if we do, you know, from the standard library C out, all we need to do is do uh, say include some file and then do printf or C out. 
Now here we've got to do a little more setup. Now we're going to do something. This instruction is LI. It stands for load immediate. And it means we're going to put whatever's on the right side of this comma into this register on the left side. Now registers are what we, we generally talk about two types of memory uh, when we're looking at MIPS and that's going to be you know, our main memory that we're kind of used to from the from you know normal programming and then uh, register memory. And so register memory is this really fast SRAM that uh, has predefined names. So in this case, uh, V0 is the name of a register that can hold a 32-bit uh, value. Now the V registers are typically for return values from subprograms. And you can think of a subprogram a lot of times as a uh, um, similar to a, a function in a high-level programming language. Now V0 in particular is used for um, setting up services. Um, in this case, we need to print a string. So we'll load in this value four here. So the four stands for print string. Um, there's other ones if you want to say print an integer or print a float. Uh, but here we want to print a string. So we need to set that up. So when we load it in here, uh, this will say, hey, I'm going to want to print sometime in the future. And so when we actually do end up initiating and executing this print, uh, it will check V0 and it will make sure that, it's a, hey, what am I supposed to be doing when I do a syscall? Um, okay, so that's pretty much everything there. So again, we're doing we're loading an immediate value. An immediate value is one that we specify. So we're specifying four, so four will go into V0 at this point. So then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to load um, we're going to load an address. So an address means um, something in memory, not in a register. Uh, so here we're going to load an address into A0. Now the A registers, unlike the V registers, V registers, like we said, are for uh, uh, return values. And then A registers are typically for arguments. So we'll load in this, we, we're gonna have another label that we'll look at later called greeting. Uh, and we're going to load um, that address into A0. So moving on, now that we've kind of set up our print, so here we're saying, okay, I want to print something. Specifically, I want to print a string. That's what the four represents. And then here we say, okay, now the argument to that print is going to be an A0. So what am I printing? Well, I'll pass you a memory address for what I want to print, which in this case will be something uh, that's in the label greeting, uh, or it's at the uh, memory address that greeting represents. So then when we call syscall, what happens is um, this uh, processor, this MIPS processor that we're simulating will uh, end up executing whatever the uh, service is specified in V0. So in this case, it's a print string. So it'll print a string out to this console uh, down here. Now uh, we've got nothing left to do anymore. So you might as well just exit the program. So normally in a C style program, we do you know, return zero at the end of our main function. Now here it's a little bit different. Like I said, we have got, you know, this V zero that we use for services. So specifically, if we want to exit or terminate a program, we'll load in, uh, in this case, another immediate value, and we'll load in 10. And 10 is the, uh, is the option for program termination. So again, we have to load it in, but loading it in doesn't actually terminate the program we have to call syscall again, and that will read whatever's in the V0 register, and it will kill the program. Now we don't need to worry about loading something new into the A0 register. Um, in this case, for program termination, it's not going to say read that argument uh, register. Now, we looked at that dot .text um, directive that said everything after this is going to be um, instructions that we're going to execute. And we have another one, which is this dot .data uh, directive and this says that whatever follows is going to be stored in the static data region of memory so this is where we can um, we can specify our variables and specifically uh, we'll specify or rather this label this greeting that we mentioned earlier so this says I want to create a new label for convenience that way I don't have to say mess around with raw memory addresses um, or you know any anything else uh, I want a label called greeting and then for this label, I'm gonna call another directive that says, treat what's after this label as an ASCII 
uh, or a string. So it's going to be ASCII characters. And specifically, we've got two options. It can be ASCII or ASCII Z. And so with ASCII Z, it automatically will make it null terminated. Uh, versus if we just do ASCII, um, we're going to have to, if we want to print a string, uh, we're going to have that have to add that null terminator character to the end of the string. And so that null termination is just kind of a formatting thing um, that just signifies this is the end of the string. So that's going to be it. So this will create a label right here called greeting. This label will have a memory address uh, associated with it. And then over here, we're saying, you know, what do I want to represent? I want to represent ASCII characters um, that's null terminated as a string. And what is that string going to be? Hello world. So that's going to do it for this example. If we go ahead and go to, uh, uh, let's go to run, and then, you know, it's not compiling anymore. So we have already have the assembly, so we need to assemble it. So here we go. So this is what the code is actually going to look at, look like. So with this, um, so what does this load turn into, this load immediate? It's just going to turn into a simple add because we know the arguments ahead of time. And if you want the actual numbers of the registers, you see this dollar sign two and dollar sign zero over here. You can look those up over here as far as what number of registers they are. So dollar sign two will be this V zero register. And so what we're doing is we're adding zero, the zero register, which is static, it's always zero. You can't, you can read it, but you can't write it. So it's adding zero and then the immediate value four and storing it in V zero. And then uh, over here, we're going to be loading from uh, the label greeting. So that has a specific, uh, that's located in memory, which you can see right here. So this is our data segment. So up here we have our text segment, which are the instructions. And you see that they're associated. They start at a specific address. And then you see the data segment starts at a different address. So we've got the separation between our instructions and our data. And so here you see also that we've got our hello world. It may look a little funny, but that's just how it's represented. Um, so we've got H-E-L-L-O comma W-O-R-L-D exclamation point. So that is our hello world in our data segment. Now, it may be hard for us to read like this, but we don't need to worry about reading. That's what the simulator is for. So then we actually call our syscall after that. Then we do another add immediate where we add 10 to uh, and store it in V0 again, which remember is two, uh, uh, register two overall. And then we call syscall again to terminate the program. So let's go ahead and look at uh, what happens. So if we you know run step by step, we can see over here, we've got register two gets updated to four, which is V0. We can step by step again now. Um, so this AT register is uh, is another one that we don't have control over. That's used specifically by uh, uh, that's used by the assembler. So we don't have control over that. Um, then if we continue on, we do the syscall, and so now A zero we see is updated with that memory address here, that greeting. And if we continue on, go to another instruction, we see that after we call the syscall, we get a printout of hello world down at the very bottom. Now the only thing left to do is we step again. Now we'll update V0 again with A now. So in hex A is equal to decimal 10. And so that'll say, okay, we're gonna kill the program now after we call syscall. And then finally we call syscall and the program terminates. So like I said, um, a little different than a high level language like C or C++ or Python, um, but still a lot of the concepts are the same. We just have to be a little more careful and do things a little more explicitly because we're not, we don't have this nice abstraction layer, you know, um, we don't have this nice abstraction layer to deal with. You know, we've got to kind of manually do it. Uh, okay, so that's going to go ahead and do it for this video. And uh, all of this code is available at my github page at github.com slash coffee before arch so if we go over here we see all of the other series that i do including c some parallelism stuff gp programming with cuda um, a lot of repositories now so if we go to mips crash course and we go to intro and we go to hello world.asm we've got this program that we used in uh used for this uh example so feel free to check this out 
Um, play around with it in you know, whatever simulator you want. So I'm using Mars. Like I said, uh, there's other ones out there. So there's Spim and Cute Spim, which is another MIPS simulator. So it's another alternative. But um, yeah, I hope this helps out. And uh, thanks for watching and hope you have a nice day.